At first, it may appear that there are four unknowns, H, D, E, and B. But we only have two equations, Ampere's and Faraday's law here, to solve for these four unknowns. But if you look in any electromagnetics textbook or online, you will also find what are called these constitutive relations. And there are two of them. The constitutive relations describe how a material, a material responds to the presence of electric or magnetic fields. For example, the first equation here describes how the total B field changes inside of a material having a permeability, mu. And the second equation describes how an E field, I know that's on opposite sides of the equation, we'll talk about that later, how the E field changes inside of a material with a permittivity um, epsilon. So we'll talk more about these later, but for now, these from these two constitutive relations, we can see that we can relate D to E and B to H. So returning to Maxwell's equations, if we can relate D to E, epsilon E, and B to H, mu H, it turns out now we have two equations and two unknowns where our uh, unknowns we could choose either usually E and H or B and D usually. There, that's a little written more clearly. So to solve for electromagnetic wave propagation, whether we're dealing with a super simple scenario or a highly complex problem, we need to solve for the electric and magnetic fields. We're going to solve for E and H in this class. And in order to solve for the electric and magnetic fields, we need to solve Ampere's and Faraday's laws in whatever form of these equations that uh, we can most easily apply to the problem at hand. In our case, the propagation of an EMP towards an airplane. Next, so we're going to be solving for E and H. Next, we need to figure out what kind of electromagnetic propagation we're interested in for our scenario of interest. For example, what kind of electromagnetic waves from a nuclear explosion can reach an airplane? Yeah, I think I'm supposed to be here. It is helpful to know both the spatial geometry of the wave, like what shape does the wave have when it reaches the airplane, and also the frequency content of the wave. Of course, Within some distance of the explosion, an airplane could easily be destroyed, so we're not really going to consider that region. But how far away would an airplane need to be from the blast in order to keep operating and land safely? In this case, it's helpful to perform a literature, literature search, search on EMPs so we can know a little bit more about them. Looking up information about EMPs, we can find out that an EMP from a nuclear blast is typically divided up into three time frames, E1, E2, and E3. The E3 component involves the lowest frequencies, corresponding to really long wavelengths that are significantly larger than the size of an airplane. So we're going to ignore this component for this design challenge because they won't interact much with the airplane because the wavelengths are so large. The E2 component is similar to lightning, which airplanes already have some protection against, so we're not going to focus on that component either. The E1 component is the quickest, and it also has the highest amplitude electric fields on the order of tens of kilovolts per meter. The frequency range of the E1 component is about 1 megahertz to 300 megahertz. That's the range we're going to be focused on, and that corresponds to a wavelength of um, uh, 300 meters at 1 megahertz. So wavelength here to 1 meter at 300 megahertz. So that's our wavelength range. And in other words, the airplane is many wavelengths long at the highest frequencies. And um, and so the E1 component can really interact a lot with the airplane. As a result, we will focus on this component and how it might affect the operation of the aircraft.
Now we know the frequency content of the EMP we're interested in. Now spatially, what is the shape of the EMP once it reaches the airplane? We'll learn more about this in the antennas portion of this class, but if the airplane is at, at a position that is sufficiently far, in quotes, from the source, say at least a couple wavelengths, you know, wavelength, oops, wavelength, it, it, it depends on kind of the geometry of the source and so forth, but let's say a, at least a couple wavelengths away to be safe, then we can often assume that the incident wave is a plane wave and the fields only change along the direction of propagation. For example, if you have an antenna like the one here that radiates perfectly in all directions, you would have a spherical wave front. But if you're at a position along the wave front that is sufficiently far, like down here it's shown, we're say more than a couple wavelengths away, then we can often assume that locally around this observer the wave front looks about like oh, just a flat uh, planar wave front. So can we assume we have a plane wave incident on the airplane? Well, we just calculated the wavelengths for the E1 component range from 1 to 300 meters. So if our airplane is at least, say, about 600 meters away from the blast zone or the weapon, the incident EMP may be approximated as a plane wave. So let's go ahead and assume our plane is at least 600 meters away, because if it's any closer, that probably uh, the EMP would not be the greatest threat to the operation of the airplane. So this is shown here. The arrow indicates the direction of the propagating EMP, uh, and the straight parallel lines here, this is a symbol that we use in electromagnetics to indicate that we have a plane wave, that locally here we can assume the E and the H fields only change their constant across this plane and they only change in the direction of propagation. Now a question you might have is under what circumstances can we use a plane wave approximation? I mean is this kind of a special circumstance? Are we simplifying it a lot just for this class? And the answer is, is no, not at all. Uh, this is used all the time, this approximation, uh, very rapidly in a lot of applications where at least a couple wavelengths away and so we can use a plane wave approximation really often. Um, now of course it is very simple in that uh, the plane wave is assumed to be infinitely wide and we can't actually produce that in real life because it, it won't go on forever and ever but that's the same as like a sinusoid in time it doesn't go on forever and ever and ever but there are very useful approximations and studies we can do with sinusoids even though they don't p exist perfectly in nature so this is a, often a good enough scenario that we can use uh, go ahead and take out your in-class project notebooks and spend a couple minutes and describe the E1, E2, and E3 components and which one we're interested in and why. And two, uh, also describe that we're going to consider the incident EMP on the airplane a e uh, plane wave and why we can make that assumption. Oops, that's interesting. Okay.